Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into hamstrings. I have a fun fact for you to start this off. What is it? We are on the 15th episode out of 18. We have one more guest episode left and then a few miscellaneous muscle groups and we'll be wrapped up with this muscle series. How does it make you feel? Excited, <laughs> happy, uh, happy that everyone is learning so much and enjoying it so much, uh, but overall just very proud of everything that we've put into it. It's been a lot. I would add relief to yeah. that list. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that happiness was. <laughs> happiness with some weight lifted off our shoulders mm -hmm. and a big project being completed is a nice feeling. Yeah, exciting stuff. Well, that means today we're diving into hamstrings. Hamstrings. What a fun one. It is a fun one. Again, feel like we say that for everyone, but <laughs> to us, muscles are fun. Yes. So it's fair to say that. I think a fun fact I can share with you okay. is that, and this is for the listeners as well, of course, but the first time that my brain turned on was in high school when I took my first anatomy and resistance training class. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know that my brain functioned the way that it can and does now. But when I first took that class, that was like the first time that I felt compelled to apply myself during school. I hadn't applied myself at all through school and just kind of like skated by, played sports. That's all I cared about. And then I took my first anatomy course and I was infatuated. And ever since then, it has been a daily conversation or a part of my life every single day since then. So fun fact. Knowing you, that doesn't surprise me at all that that's what it took. And also knowing how excited you get over all of this and how your brain works. Um, it just all it makes sense. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you're here to share your skills and your brain with us yes. um, and that it stayed on since then <laughs> yeah, for you the know, most part. It could just <laughs> shut off tomorrow. Who knows? You know, sometimes it does <laughs> during the day when you just, it feels like you can't hear what I'm saying, but it, it's it's good for that the just most happens. part. <laughs> That's, that has nothing to do with my brain. Okay. On. <laughs> <laughs> well, diving into hamstrings, do you want to go ahead and start off and talk about the function of the hamstrings? Sure. So the main function that we will be focusing on is going to be bending at the knee. That's one. And then we have the second one being the extension of the hip. And then we also have the rotation of the hip. Now, the two that you're going to train the most through resistance training that we'll talk more on today are going to be bending at the knee and then also also extending at the hip. Now, if I'm someone who I deal with knee pain, does that mean I shouldn't train hamstrings then because it's dealing with bending of the knee? No, I think that addressing what the knee pain is stemming from is going to be important. But being able to have strong and healthy mobile hamstrings is going to be a part in your knee feeling better. And so by not strengthening that tissue and putting it in a position where it would be consistently tight and not providing the stability it can and should to the knee is probably causing more issues. And so I would look at the exercises that you would be able to train the hamstrings without bending at the knee while you're figuring out what's going on with the knee and then be able to do the things that are hip hinging and training through hip extension. And then once the knee is addressed, now we start to incorporate the things that are bending more at the knee. Gotcha. So when it comes to the function and I understand, okay, I'm bending or extending at the knee and I am doing that extension at the hip, what does that look like when it comes to the origin and insertion to help me understand that muscle a little bit more? Sure. And what you meant with the, the knee is going to be knee flexion. Yes. yes. My apologies. It's okay. It's <laughs> easy because it's yes. extending at the hip, but flexing at the knee. Yes. Knee and that flexion. Can be, exactly. <laughs> that can be very confusing um, as we're talking through these things. Now, with the hamstring, there are going to be three portions to the hamstring. We have the first, wait, you didn't ask me what the hamstrings were specifically. You asked about the origin and the insertion. I did. 
we'll go ahead and start with the three portions of the hamstring and then get into the origin and the insertion. Now, the first one is going to actually be tucked under the two main parts that you would see in a jacked and shredded bodybuilder. This is going to be the symbi, symbi membranosis. I believe that <laughs> is exactly. mouthful exa for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that one's tucked under. And then we have the semi tendinosis, which is going to be the inner or most medial head of the hamstring. And this is going to be um, the one that is closest to the midline of the body and is going to, you'll see it on jacked bodybuilders. <laughs> and then the one that is the most distal or towards the outer portion of the leg is going to be the long head of the bicep fr fr uh, femoris. <laughs> Why is that a tongue twister today? I'm not sure. Maybe it's because we're on episode 15, <laughs> but <laughs> there we go. Bicep femoris. Perfect. So then where do those, do those all originate and insert in the same spot or do they have different spots? So they're all going to originate on the lower portion of the pelvis. The both of the semi attach on the inner portion of the uh, lower leg, which is going to be the tibia. And you wanna know how I separate between the tibia and the fibula? How? Is that, and this is what my mom told me as I was studying with her, I think in high school or maybe in early college, is that, and, and I'm huge on analogies when it comes to just remembering things when it comes to terms and so on. So. What the analogy was is that when we are talking about great people in this world, we leave fibbers outside. People that lie, people that mm -hmm. fib, they're on the outside of the good party. Mm -hmm. And the fibula is going to be on the outside of the leg. The tibia That's is perfect. going to be on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that helps you all in remembering the difference between the fibula and the tibia. And then the long head attaches on that fibula. Well, that really is going to be something that I never forget now because fibbers are out. Get them out. So fibula, we don't want outside. Them here, but we want the tibia on the yes, side. We do. The tibbers are good. The fibbers, <laughs> they're out. See you later. So uh, past the tongue twisting talk, that can be a little bit confusing. What does it look like for just how we use our hamstrings? What are some activities that we use our hamstrings when it comes to day-to-day -day life? So with the activities, we're going. the big one is going to be running. I think it's going to play such a large role in just your ability to walk and pull your leg back. There's going to be big parts of that. What are some of the other ones that you think of? Well, yeah, just your gait cycle. And yes, of course, that is going to have to do with running or walking, but it is a part of just what your gait is altogether that really pulls into your hamstrings. But things like climbing stairs and standing are also going to use your hamstrings. So pretty involved in your daily activity. I would say one that people forget to talk about because it's not a muscle group that is going to be contributing necessarily to the action of doing the thing is going to be squats. So the hamstrings are not challenging the squats. If you were to be doing a barbell back squat specifically, they're going to be training the quads, the adductors, and the glutes. But what the hamstrings are doing is that they are stabilizing the lower leg. Like you don't have the hamstrings, you're just going to fall. <laughs> they're a big part in the lowering of the weight as well as being able to drive the hips forward and keeping that upper leg stable. So the hamstrings play a big role in squats. Mm -hmm. Now, what about when it comes to the visual appearance of hamstrings? What does that really add? Because I feel like everyone wants, okay, I want my glutes to grow or I want a certain line in my quad. What do we get from our hamstrings? Oh, okay, this is, this is one of my biggest pet peeves, even within my own physique, is that when you turn to your side profile, and maybe you have ginormous glutes and maybe you have great quads, but if you have just a board from your glute to your knee of like no hanging hamstring whatsoever, and it just shrinks the circumference and the width that we're able to see for that lower leg or the upper leg, it really just takes away from the look. Mm -hmm. Like I, to me, I think a ham in, or a, a ham and ham, a ham and <laughs> a hanging hamstring is the coolest thing. When someone's sitting down in a pair of shorts mm -hmm. and their hamstrings just hanging off the, I mean, you can see it from the side. It's just the coolest look to me. Mm -hmm. Much more impressive. Now, it's very unlikely that someone has 
very nice hamstrings and doesn't have the quad development to match it because it's generally kind of a, a, a one-to-one ratio in those scenarios where I have seen individuals have really great quads but lack a lot of hamstring. And so, because, well, we don't have to get into the nuance of all that. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that you started to talk about, you just said like the look of the hamstring, but I think that if you don't want your butt to look fake, make sure you have some hamstrings. And I even saw a comparison photo of someone who went through of just training their glutes and what their side profile looked like and then what it looked like of training glutes and hamstrings and then seeing glutes, hamstrings, and quads. And they were just such different looks all the way through. And you might be thinking of like, well, maybe I want it to look like I have a BBL, so I'm just not gonna train hamstrings. You can still maybe not have the goal to grow your hamstrings and make them look bigger. But having hamstring strength is so important for everything that we just talked about of how mobile you are. And I think oftentimes people get into the place of how does it look, which I do too, like not saying that I only think about the function, but they think so much about the look, they don't think about the function of how it helps their body just move throughout the day. Because I feel like, yes, I hear people say of, oh, I want huge glutes or I want this muscle group bigger. But more often than not, I hear, especially at the core of it, I want to be athletic or I want to be mobile or I want to play with my kids and my grandkids. And being able to do that is a well-rounded picture of making sure that each muscle works synergistically together. Yes. I mean, the the function is a huge part. And there was a a recent study that found that 95% of people over the age of 30 will never sprint again. And I think that that is a wild statistic to hear. You got to repeat that again. 95% of the people over the age of 30 will never sprint again. That like 95% is insane to think about. But as we're at this age, like it makes sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. It's a wild stat to see, but I'm also not surprised by seeing what's around me Mm -hmm. and the people that are around my age and, and older than me. I can understand that it's a real, like, I don't think that it is a illegitimate stat. I think that it is very likely to be true. Now, would you say that the reason that people can't sprint is because they're not training their hamstring enough, or is it due to another reason that they wouldn't be able to sprint past that age? When we're talking about 95% of the people over the age of 30, there is not going to be one reason. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. true. There's going to be a multitude of reasons why they're not sprinting any longer. The first one I would say is because the only reason they sprinted before was that they were in a sport that required them to do the sprinting. Now the sport is removed. They no longer have that accountability and they're not able or knowledgeable or desire to hold themselves accountable. So then they just stop sprinting, Mm -hmm. which is, I would say probably the largest majority. Um, Other factors is that they lose the desire to do physical activity. They haven't found a way to do physical activity that's fun and sustainable for them. And so then they become more stagnant, they gain weight, they don't feel comfortable, and that their body is just always tight. They're dealing with some form of pain, so on and so forth. I think those two categories probably encapsulate the largest percentage of that. And then you have a bunch of like smaller percentage things that who knows what the reason would be. And thinking of like, a lot of people in their 30s are at a desk job. They're not moving around a lot. They're not stretching. And then the next time that they decide to sprint is normally something of like, oh, my friend dared me to do this, or we're playing a pickup game of basketball or football. I should just be able to sprint. And then that's when people get injured very easily. And we've seen it with a few different people we watch online of older people. And they're like, 40s and 50s of deciding I'm going to sprint and then truly pulling their hamstring or hurting themselves even worse because they weren't in a spot to be able to sprint. Yes. You want to, and you hear this from so many people as they age, is that they mentally feel a significantly younger age, but their body is the current age or older Mm -hmm. than what they are. And that brain, when you get the challenge, is like, (laughs) I can do this. Yeah. (laughs) Back in high school, even though that was 20 years ago, I ran like a 4-4. And it's mm-hmm. like, no, you didn't. You didn't run a 4 <laughs> 4 but we can all tell this story now. And then they try to run and then they pop their hamstring in that setting. And so having the resistance training, but also having the 
ability to run on a consistent basis that is not in a way of like, I have to do a marathon or I have to do a half marathon, whatever the case may be, but just being able to have that physical activity and using the skill, using the ability so that you're able to maintain it. Because as we have seen over time, as we stop doing things, we lose the skill. The, the skill gets weaker and we either lose it or it's just one that we are constantly saying, oh, I'm just not good at that thing anymore. And I think that within hamstrings and with sprinting or running, the fact of changing direction or slowing down or stopping put a ton of strain on the muscle. And people aren't thinking of that. They might think, oh, the hard part is the running fast or the sprinting. But really, the strain on your muscle comes from, it can come from overstriding and being in a place of during the running. I'm not saying it can't come from that, but it's that trying to stop, slow down, or change direction that puts a lot of strain on those muscles because those also aren't things that we're doing all the time of slowing down from a really fast speed or juking and jiving. We're not doing those on a daily basis, and that's where people can really hurt themselves. Yeah. And it's something that we're always just developing our understanding on as we grow older, our training changes, because even looking at our training, it's something that we've had such a big focus on bodybuilding and body composition for um, the last at least seven to eight years of our own training, if not more than that. And now we're shifting into this space of like, oh, we're seeing the whole picture. We're seeing the downsides of just focusing on body composition. Let's get some more cardiovascular work in place. Let's get a little bit more mobility. Let's get agility. Let's have a more balanced routine to be the healthiest version of ourselves because we see what is ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Like we want to be able to play with our future children and be able to, I want to be able to beat our children at every sport oh, possible I know you do. as long no as humanly mercy. possible. <laughs> Zero mercy. I'm going to be dunking on them for until I physically cannot. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do everything in my power to be able to do that. Yeah. And so we see the picture before it's there. And so we're shifting our, our, the way that we train our, our perspective on these things. And I would encourage literally everyone to look at it in this lens, because this is what is on the horizon of just being in the best health and shape of your entire life for the rest of your life. Yeah. Can I tell a funny story about uh, wanting to dunk on your kids? Sure. Okay. So this was probably, it was probably when my dad was in his late thirties to sometime in his forties. I don't remember for certain, but he was being a like counselor or a chaperone, whatever you want to call it, at a youth camp. And within the first 30 minutes of getting to this youth camp, my mom was at home with me and my sister, and we were having like a girls' weekend. We were much younger, and we were like scrapbooking. We had our movies lined up, and the uh, high schoolers were all playing basketball. And my dad thought, I could school some of these kids, obviously. And so he went in to play basketball with these kids and in one motion ends up tearing his ACL, breaking his wrist and falling to the ground because he went up to like try and go dunk. But it was that aspect of trying to change directions, going up after not warming up, not having the correct mobility in place and just coming down, twisting that uh, knee and landing on his wrist to go ahead and break that. So um, he ended up coming home for the weekend. Our neighbor went and replaced him as the chaperone and we got to take care of him um, the whole weekend instead of our girl weekend. But that's a prime example of he was just like, I feel good enough to play basketball with these kids. And then he ended up <laughs> absolutely <laughs> demolishing himself. Yeah, that's called broken body. That's, yeah. You don't have to say the ACL, the wrist, it's just yeah. broke his body. Exactly. Like a Tom Segura type move up in there. <laughs> yeah. But that's something where if you're thinking, okay, like I still feel very mobile right now. It's like, okay, think five or 10 years down the road, you're still going to want to play with either your kids or even your friends or whatever it may be, and just being able to make sure you can do what you want to do. Like that's something that I really try to find out from clients is what do you want to be able to do? Because we can, of course, make you look a certain way, but really looking at what you want for you, like what makes this a success of, oh, I can, like I have a client who's going to go hike in like the mountains of Bhutan. And it's like, I want to be able to do that without absolutely demolishing myself and not being able to recover. And it's like, okay, we can do that. And we can work on these different things to get you to where you want to go. I freaking love that. <laughs> <laughs>
Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible for you. You should lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are needed. Keto Squats for life. are bad for your Squats are great You should squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. So what are some ways that you could take care of your hamstring muscles if you wanted to make sure you didn't end up like Mike? (laughs) So taking care of the hamstring muscles, I would work through resistance training and being able to create good tension at different positions in which the muscle is being challenged through the weight that you're applying. What a, I mean, what a statement. Yeah, crazy. (laughs) So with that, I would, that's where I would start. I would be able to work through exercises and it be something where I'm able to improve my range of motion and I'm able to work through without having any pain or um, discomfort in other areas of my body, my lower back, my knee, whatever the case may be. So I'd start there. And then I would go through static stretching as a useful tool as you're going throughout your day. If you are someone like myself and like Sue, who sits at your desk a large part of the day, there's going to be a necessity to go through static stretching, yoga, dynamic work prior to your resistance training sessions to make sure that your body is in a equipped position to take on the demands and the stress that you're trying to place on it, um, to strengthen the muscle tissue, to challenge it in different ways. And so keeping those things in mind as you're going through your day, I think those three are going to be the the main catalyst, if you will. Mm -hmm. And if someone's having like hip pain or knee pain, should they like push through it? Or is that a real sign of, hey, I should pull back and make sure that I'm not doing this movement or this exercise? Anytime that pain presents, you've got to get to the root of why the pain is happening. It's not something that we need to push through. I know that many former athletes, including myself, are like, pain is just a response that my body needs to get more adapt. (laughs) My body needs to adapt to the stress more and I just need to push through pain. Pain and soreness, two different things. Or challenging, like pain and something being hard or challenging are two different things. Correct. And there are varying levels of these things as well. And so you need to be able to grade this accordingly for yourself and try not to put yourself in a situation where you are just clustering everything into this is all pain. Well, no, some of it's soreness, but we've got something actually going on at the hip, at the knee. Let's figure out why we're having this issue. Is there a misalignment? Are we doing something wrong within the exercise? Do we need to get a professional involved to look at what we have going on? X-rays, all those different things, like really wanting to get to the bottom of it and not being your own doctor in that situation of, well, it's, it's going to take so much time. I'll just, I'll figure it out and just like push through. And then Three years later, you're like, oh, now I'm dealing with this and I'm having to do way more work than I would have had the three years ago of just adjusting how I was exercising. Like that happens to way more people than what we can even probably think about right now. Yeah. And so, you know, not just pushing through pain for the sake of pushing through pain. Mm -hmm. And there are some times where you might not feel that much pain as you're doing the exercise, and it might take you compounding doing it wrong for a while to actually feel the full extent of the pain. So not saying that, oh, any discomfort, you should stop at what you're doing, but you should assess what you're doing if you do have discomfort of what is this coming from, and am I feeling a lot of like cracking and resistance to this, or Or is it just that, oh, this is a movement that's difficult for me type of thing? Right. So do you want to go into exercises and what we find to be the best? Sure. Exercises are pretty slim when it comes to hamstring training, uh, as we have two main functions that we would be challenging through resistance with the knee flexion and the hip extension. Um, The list is short. So for the knee flexion, you would have the seated hamstring curl and you'd have the lying hamstring curl. Then you would have for the hip extension, it would be a uh, stiff-legged deadlift. You have multiple variations of this and there's a lot of variations to doing it with dumbbell, single leg, um, making it obviously the unilateral work, like all those things. We have different variations, but those really are your three 
main exercises. Would you have anything to add to that? What about like 45 degree hip extension? Could. I think the 45 degree hip extension is going to be a, a possibility there if it's set up properly. The GHR is another one. You could do like a, a Nordic curl is a great one for uh, challenging through the eccentric portion of the exercise. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is slim pickings, but um, that makes it easy for us to talk about everything. And I'm not going to dive into everything when it comes to a lying hamstring curl versus a seated hamstring curl. If you want to hear more about that, then tune in to the next episode with Cody McBroom, where Alex and him talk about that uh, more in depth. But when it comes to the RDL, do you personally prefer using dumbbells or do you like being able to use a barbell or a trap bar or maybe even a cable? So I personally, prefer to utilize the trap bar. I like that the loading is at my sides. I also like that I'm able to load this up significantly. Whereas with dumbbells, we can get to a place where as the dumbbells exceed 100, they're pretty bulky. And it's going to be a lot of energy expended just getting into position to lift the weight. And I feel that with the trap bar, I'm able to just stand a little bit more comfortably. Now, some of you out there will be like, eh, standing with dumbbells and standing with the trap bar are probably going to be about the same. Mm -hmm. Listen, getting it off the rack. I mean, we can go into the yeah. real deep weeds of this, but I like the trap bar probably the most. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy the trap bar or I like the Smith machine, but one thing to keep in mind with the Smith machine is going to be like your liver your livers, your levers and limb lengths, because you can end up getting way too much into a squat position if it ends up that you maybe have longer femurs um, and are dealing with Again, those different levers that cause you to, oh, if the bar's right in front of me, instead of being able to have like the dumbbells or the trap bar to my side, then that can inhibit how your movement pattern goes. Which I think raises a great question of, do you need to have the dumbbells, the barbell, the Smith machine rubbing against your thigh as you lower the weight in an RDL? I don't think that it needs to be like glued to your leg or I've seen people like do different uh, cueing of maybe they have a PVC pipe or they have a uh, foam roller and they have the person like hold it against their thigh and they show as your arms go down if they should not go far away. I don't think that it needs to be glued to it, but I think that it's just understanding why people even say that. And that's the aspect of if you let the weight fall too far in front of you of like it just like is really far in front of you, then that is going to not only mess up your levers of going through the movement, but it also can make it harder on your lower back of having that weight so far in front of you. So I don't think that it needs to be glued to your side or like right against you're going against your thigh and then you're going against your shin. I think it's more so of keeping it close to your body, but not making it be, it has to be touching. So my perspective is more of just let the weight fall. Mm -hmm. What the intention of the RDL is going to be is pushing the hips back and forward. And I think that focusing so much on like, how am I positioning my hands removes the focus of what the actual exercise is all about. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want to keep the weight centered. That's the biggest thing. We don't want it to be super close to us and we don't want it to be super far away to throw off our balance and myriad of other things. But we just want to just let the weight fall because all we're thinking about is pushing the hips back. These are just serving as hooks. We're just hooking ourselves into the weight to be able to push our hips back, find great tension as, as we are pushing the hips back in our glutes and hamstrings, find that end range, contract our glutes together and push the hips forward. We are simply having a, like, I think that a great analogy for this is that if I was to be standing in front of you with a table, mm -hmm. I have that table right at your uh, hip crease and I am pushing that table into you. And as your, as your hips are pushed back, your upper body is folding forward. There's going to be a point where if I continue to push you, you're going to fall over. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the same thing that you would apply to the RDL is that if you just continue to fall back, like you're going to, going to lose your balance and fall backwards. But the more that we're able to hinge at the hip, we're going to create greater length through the glutes. We're going to create greater length through the hamstrings. And then the cue to drive it back is just simply push the table back to me. 
Just contract your glutes and push your hips forward. And by pushing your hips forward is what's going to lift your upper body. You're not going to be in a position where I have the weight down here and I'm, I'm so strong and I'm gonna be so ferocious that I'm gonna yank this weight up and by pulling this weight up, my hips will come through doing so. Because that's where we get the pain to the lower back. That's where we get the discomfort through the neck and through the shoulders of like, oh my gosh, I feel really My tense. traps are hurting after this movement. My upper back hurts so much. Right, and so that's where that stems from. And so really being in a position where we're able to drop the ego and just have the weight to our sides and focus on driving the hips back, driving the hips forward and make this more simple than this being a like, I'm so strong and I'm going to lift as much as humanly possible. That time will come as you get better at the movement. But just because you can move it through space doesn't mean that you're accomplishing the actual goal. I think that's so important to note. And I think that that's a common mistake is that people just try to go from point A to point B instead of really thinking about the tension. And within an RDL, you're thinking that this is a horizontal movement instead of a vertical movement where so many people think, okay, I lower the weight down and I stand back up. And it's like, no, you're going through that hip extension. You're pushing your hips back and then being able to come to that hip extension to get you to where you want to go. So always thinking of it as, this is a horizontal movement instead of a vertical really, really helps me in my brain of like, oh, okay, that's what I need to be doing. Yes. And I, I feel this is one that is is common, commonly misunderstood when we talk about the function of the hip. Like as you are pushing the hips back, your hips are going into flexion. Although your glutes are lengthening, they're not going into flexion, but your hips are going into flexion. As you drive your hips forward and your glutes contract, your hips are now in extension. And so those two things get crisscrossed so often. I just want to have this piece of content that will live on forever that yeah. has it right there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what are some other common mistakes or helpful cueing that you use when it comes to different hamstring movements? That's the RDL. I know you were working on one recently to make sure that you could cue properly uh, to clients. So with that one in particular, I find that the video is probably best. Mm -hmm. So if you guys are having trouble with the RDL, I would encourage you to email us, DM us, so I can get you the link, because I don't think that there's really another way to share yeah, it. Or I can add it to the playlist on YouTube. Okay, that will mm -hmm. work too. So that is great because it covers everything. And I have found that if I set a client up, even in the setting in which I'm not, obviously not there, they're still able to get it set up and then it fixes the issue that's presented. So very helpful, but is challenging to try and talk through without the visual. Yeah. I think that a cue or something that I see happen a lot with clients and just on the internet, other than what we've already talked about within RDLs, is just way too much range of motion. Is that people think that, oh, since I can get my the dumbbells to my toes or I can stretch to my toes, that that's going to give my hamstrings greater stretch. But as soon as your hips stop going back, that is the end range of the movement. And how people cheat that is they then their hips stop going back, they start lowering their upper body. And all that's working is your lower back. And so that's where that lower back pain comes from too. And being able to really think of instead of how do I have the most flexibility in this movement of when do my hips stop going back? And then that's the end of the movement. I will add that the sciatic nerve runs from the lower back all the way down to the foot. And so when we're going through an RDL, you can sensationally feel this tremendous stretch and that can be sensationally stemming from that nerve relative to the actual muscle. And I see a lot of people running into that of like, I felt this all the way down to my toes. Mm -hmm. Like as I kept going down, it got more and more intense. And I'm like, no, 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 that's a nerve response. Like yeah. that is giving you <laughs> feedback of, hey, we've got a little bit of a pinch here. Mm -hmm. We got something going on. This is not you getting more hamstring involved in that exercise. Now, something else talking about sensation over tension. What about uh, if I go ahead and I elevate my toes? Because I I'll probably feel way more stretch in my hamstrings, right? <laughs> so you will, again, sensationally feel that. And that comes down to the, the nerve uh, response there. But at the same time, we want to look at how the knee is being stabilized. If we are to bring our toes up and go into what is called dorsiflexion, we're going to 
uh, lower the amount of stability that we're providing to that knee from the gastroc or the, the calf. And so we want to stay in a position where our foot is flat and we're driving the midsole of our foot into the ground. And that's going to be the best position for us to be able to train the hamstrings in the RDL or the glutes, depending on if we're going with a more bent knee variant or a stiff knee variant. Um, and the same thing would go within elevating the heels. So now we're going into plantar flexion, bringing the toes down. And in that position there, it's going to be challenging for you to hinge and maintain your center of mass. And so what ends up often happening is that people will go into um, anterior pelvic tilt to shift their hips up to to try and balance things out. And so then they're getting a lot more discomfort to their lower back in that setting to try and stay over their center of mass. Mm -hmm. Because obviously having their heels uh, elevated is pushing them forward because as the weight moves forward now, all their weight is now having to shift into their toes and they're trying to stay balanced. That one is the one that is a head scratcher to me. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know what feels good about this or why this is enticing more to you. More stretch, honey, more stretch. <laughs> that one, I see that and I'm like, ah, I, I, cause there, there are things online that are, are showing misinformation when it comes to the, the toes being elevated, especially in the sense of creating hypertrophy. There may be some other utilizations for other specific things, um, but in the sense of hypertrophy, not elevating the toes is going to be a better option and just staying flat-footed. Mm -hmm. You want to hear an analogy for dorsiflexion versus plantar flexion? Did you steal this from me? No. Do you have one? I do, but go ahead. Okay. Mine is for dorsiflexion, you're bringing your toes up towards you. You normally open the door for other people, bringing that up, like open. And then for plantar flexion, then it's something that I'm like planting my toes into the ground of like, then I'm pushing my toes more forward. Mine is that I am just putting my foot into a plant. Uh, like soil? Not even into soil, literally just a... a plant pot. Yeah. And that's all I need to see. And that is like ingrained into my memory. And then I only know there's two, I know there's two options. So, <laughs> so it's, like, it's the opposite <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. So if it's not my toes going down into that uh, pot, then I know it's dorsiflexion. Oh my gosh. Well, what about momentum when it comes to hamstring exercises? So momentum is a challenging one because we have a lot of other muscle groups that are going to be involved in the actions that we're performing. Uh, when we talk about maybe being in a lying hamstring curl and we're trying to generate a lot of force and bend our knee and get that pad as close to our glutes as possible uh, to get fully a contracted hamstring. That may be a situation where as we are generating more momentum, we may have a greater overall anterior pelvic tilt, putting more undue tension on our lower back. Now, is that because of the momentum solely or is that because of our poor execution within the exercise? You could say it's 50-50, right? So I try not to demonize momentum solely because momentum in and of itself is not a bad thing. How it is being applied to the training is what the problem is. And so momentum is, is fine and it can be applied properly when done in a setting that you know why you're using it rather than it just being like, this is how I'm going to lift as much humanly weight as humanly possible. Um, so momentum can be useful, but it can be challenging in a setting like the lying hamstring curl. Mm -hmm. And speaking on the lying hamstring curl, something else for just a helpful tip is really looking to see where the cam is. And if you're wondering what the cam is, it's normally just going to be a dot on your machine, but that's really going to line up your joints to make sure that you're not like, I've heard a lot of people be like, oh, if I'm using the, let's say, leg extension, which obviously isn't training hamstrings, but for the sake of the uh, example, I'm doing a leg extension or I'm doing a lying leg curl and I'm having a lot of pain with my knees while doing it, that can often come when I look at someone's execution, let's say everything else is correct, that their knee isn't lined up with that cam on the machine. And so that can make things very wonky um, for as you're going through it, just because it's not aligned. So really being able to look, it's literally just a dot on the machine to show you where you need to line up there. Uh, but that's gonna be a huge help with making sure you sidestep any kind of pain. One of the greatest benefits within hypertrophy is often going to be the eccentric portion of exercises and where a lot of people go wrong in the RDL or create the most momentum is through that eccentric portion of the exercise as they're lowering the dumbbells, the trap bar, what have you, and trying to bounce out of the bottom. 
where as we're lowering the weight, we know from research that the eccentric portion is very important. And then we also know from research that the lengthened position of whether we're training glutes or hamstrings is also going to be the most important when it comes to hypertrophy. And so if you are to be accelerating or trying to generate momentum as you lower the weight, and then also bouncing out of the most important part, and you're in the gym trying to achieve hypertrophy, know that the two things we know for certain that are going to get you to your goal, you are just breezing past. You're not utilizing. And that is ridiculous to me. It is quite ridiculous, but hopefully they listen to this podcast and then find out what they got to do. Amen. Or follow us on Instagram and they'll, they'll get the facts, the FAX, and be ready to go. Absolutely. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. So what about for a movement about good mornings? That's something we didn't go over, but is that a good hamstring movement? It can be. I, I think that with good mornings, it's going to be something where you want to start with a lighter load than what you think you need to, because this is going to be loading. This is not a position that you're going to find yourself in all that frequently, even though it emulates so well of the RDL how you're loading it of it, the weight being on your back now instead of in your hands is a different overall setup and is going to be a little bit more challenging to the erectors. So that's going to be something where you have to be mindful of it. And then also you have to be very cautious with the range of motion that you're allowing your chest to, to fall because we can get into a place where we are out of our active range of motion, we'll call it, and then just putting more strain on the erectors for the sake of like, I'm trying to get more stretch. Very similarly to all the other, uh, other exercises that we've talked about today, but this one even furthermore. And so I would implement this, especially if you've never done good mornings, because I do think that it's more of a uncommon movement. And you see some individuals who are doing it in the Smith machine, which again can be okay, not the best because of that fixed nature to the bar. And with a good morning, there needs to be a little bit of dynamic nature to how that bar moves. And so if you're going to be using it in a Smith machine, I would be focusing more on a particular position. So it's almost like partials because you're not able to have that dynamic nature. So pick more of a lengthened position and understand that by staying in that lengthened position, you're probably going to accumulate more overall fatigue and challenge to the muscle. So you may need less overall training volume. Now I'm getting super nuanced, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a helpful tool to understand when performing the good mornings. Yeah, and we'll keep going on with program design a little bit more when it comes to clients or when you're just building out a program, do you ever have like a full hamstring day or do you mix it in with other muscle groups? I generally will have more of a full lower body day. Now, if there is a client, now if I have someone who is a competitor and they come to me um, having competed well on the national stage and they're trying to get their pro card and there's just some gaps within their physique that need to be brought up, that individual maybe has hamstrings on the docket that needs to be brought up. And so they may have a more specific hamstring and glute day because oftentimes you're going to pair quad and glute, you're gonna pair glute and hamstring just because there's so much carryover between the, the uh, two muscle groups in those settings, depending on your exercise selection. So if we're spending a lot of time hinging, we might as well throw in the glute work because it's going to be getting work there. And we may need to just throw in some glutes if we're doing a bunch of knee flexion stuff um, or more so training through extension because that's what the quad is going to do, right? Um, so to answer your question, more of a full lower or at minimum, 
it being paired with glutes. Mm -hmm. Well, what about when it comes to sets and reps? What do you normally use for hamstrings with sets and reps? Depends on the goal. I think that that's the, you know, where is the person's training age? Where is the person's ability to challenge themselves with load selection? Are they able to um, really understand RPE? And if they send me a set to failure, is it actual failure? Are they 10 reps shy of failure? And they, you know, think that that's where that's at. So if it's the person who is very shy of failure, but to them, they think that it's failure, they're going to have a lot more sets than what I would have for someone who sends me a video to failure. And that is failure. Mm -hmm. That person's going to have a much shorter list of sets that they're performing for those particular exercises. And they're both going to attain a similar goal, potentially, uh, again, depending on a multitude of factors, right? It's not just like you do this many sets and you do this many sets and everything else is null and void and you're both going to get the same overall results, right? It's like, there's so many different factors that go into really building muscle. And this is such a big foundation piece of understanding how to train with real intensity. And so the sets and reps is a, a challenging one to just all encompassing. This is the amount of sets. This is the amount of reps. Yeah. I obviously agree big time on that one, but I think it's good to be able to talk about. And especially I love the note you made of if somebody is, doesn't have that training intensity because, uh, you might see of, okay, if you're trying to be in hypertrophy, you should do this many reps, but you want to look at that more as a guideline instead of hard and fast. If I do this exact amount of reps, then I'm going to get that exact goal because you need need to take those different factors into consideration of the training age, the intensity, um, how much you can actually engage that that musculature because I found that, okay, maybe for someone who's more advanced, they can do something for a set of three or four and that really tax them neurologically. But then for someone who's way more of a beginner, they might need to do 10 plus reps to get that same result because of those different factors. Yeah. There's so many things that go into play here of like, if someone has just more muscle density and then they also have the neurological response, they're going to be able to recruit more muscle fibers per contraction. And so they're going to get more overall output than the person who doesn't have that coordination in place. And let's say that also these movements are new to them. They've never trained hamstrings directly before, or they've never, you know, done the seated hamstring curl. Like how I approach the, the sets, the repetitions, the intensity is all going to vary depending on what that person's current situation is. And then we're going to have progressions in place to get them to where they want to be. I have a few more questions for you before we wrap up here. All right. Do hamstrings respond better to high or low reps? What does that even mean? Like what, what are we, what are we I talking about? I want a magic about? answer <laughs> and I want you to tell me exactly what to do without knowing any details about me and it to be the perfect answer. That's what I want. It's a, th this focus of high or low reps fast or slow twitch. It's like, just train. Like, why are we talking about the minutia of all this when we can't even get in the gym for a consistent month? Like, let's get to the gym. Let's train consistently. Let's show up every day and just put in effort. Who cares about all the nuance? I just want you to get the job done. And then as you get better at this, and then it starts to be something like, we need to get a little bit more specific for us to etch out just a little bit more progress. Then we can start talking about these other details. But these details are just clouding your ability to focus on the things that actually matter. And you know, both exist in a good training like plan overall of it's not that, oh, I only train low reps because that's what's best, or I only train high reps. It's I train through training phases that some have high reps, some have low, some have moderate, and it just depends on what my goal is as well as what I can do in the gym. Exactly. All right. What are the cons of weak hamstrings? So many things. Uh, possibility of injury, not being able to run well, uh, not looking good in pants, not looking good in shorts. <laughs> so many things. You got anything else to add? Um, standing can be difficult. Squatting can't really do that. Basically everything we talked about through this, if your hamstrings are weak, you're going to have a tough time with it. Mm -hmm. How do I know if my hamstrings are weak? So I think there is probably some more specific testing that I don't have available to me right this moment to assess you know, where the issue may be specifically coming from. But if we just want to generalize it as how do I know if my hamstrings are weak, I think that you would be able to pick up a load or a weight and be able to work through some of these different 
movements or how the hamstring is going to function to assess like where that weakness or tightness is going to be presenting. And also if you're having, you know, tightness or, or pain as you're bending down to pick up a case of water or you're having challenges being able to squat down, like these are going to be feedback that we have something going on that we need to address, whether it be from a strength, a mobility, just overall function, those things, you know, giving you feedback just in your day to day life. What exercise works hamstrings best? According to the literature, we have the seated hamstring curl is going to be superior to the lying hamstring curl. I would be willing to bet in terms of hypertrophy, creating more dense muscle tissue, that it's going to be a pretty tight race of if someone's able to manage doing the stiff leg deadlift, a Nordic curl, like on a GHR, um, and the seated hamstring curl. Like if you're able to do those three exercises consistently, I think that those three are going to be the best for hypertrophy. Now the challenge that comes with that is going to be they're all lengthened, biased movements that are going to have more of a systemic fatigue, meaning that your mind as well as just the rest of your body is going to have a more subtle level of fatigue. And we can talk about more local fatigue of it being like a bicep curl. Like if I do biceps and I train to absolute failure, the only thing that's really sore is my bicep. But if I go to failure in a deadlift, my whole body aches. Yeah, Everything is sore th from the back of my head to my toes. Like I can push myself to that point. And so the challenge would be if you were to have all three of those exercises, how are you able to recover from each of them and be able to progress week to week? How many times a week should I train hamstrings? If your goal is to see maximal growth, I would start with two. And then can you recover to three? And what I mean by recover is not just show up. Are you able to see logbook progressions on all three of the sessions? And are you recovered by the time that you get to the next session? So if you're going from session one and you're still sore, and then by the time you get to session three, you are even more sore because you had the compounding stress of session one to session two, and then on to three, um, that's not going to be conducive. And so you've got to look at how structuring out, if you're wanting to have that frequency, how can I structure it out to get the most strength progressions possible in each of the movements? Because you probably would progress better if in session one, you did the deadlift, in session two, you did the Nordic curl, and then in session three, you did the seated hamstring curl. And you're probably gonna have better performance in all three of those if they're on different days, rather than trying to get them all in one session. And I would, argue that you're going to have better overall results by doing them on different days rather than jamming them into just one session. Well, great answers there. That's all the questions that I had. Is there anything else that you feel is going to be really helpful for someone to know about hamstrings? No, I think that we literally covered everything possible with hamstrings. I did not think we would have this long of a conversation when it came to hamstrings because this one's pretty straightforward. Dry, yeah. But here we are. We've had a pretty decent conversation here. Yeah. And if you are wanting to be able to have all of this information put into one little cheat sheet, then don't forget to hit the link in the show notes or the description box to get that cheat sheet sent to your email. And if you want to see the exercises or even the setup that Alex talked about within being able to cue his clients, then go ahead and head to the YouTube playlist, which that's also linked on the cheat sheet, but we have it in the uh, show notes as well, just so you can take a little peek at that. But uh, we're very excited to go into the last guest episode with Cody McBroom. So make sure you check out that episode next Monday and we'll see you then.